One of the most influential political organizations in Europe has acknowledged that the European Union has essentially become a vassal of the United States. That's the word they used a vassal, referring to a subordinated relationship, a kind of feudal relationship. This is according to a research paper that was published by the European Council on Foreign Relations, which is probably the most powerful think tank or research organization in all of Europe. And by the way, this is an organization that is funded by the European Parliament itself and also receives funding from every major EU member state. The policy brief is titled The Art of Vassalization, How Russia's War on Ukraine Has Transformed Transatlantic Relations, and it was written by the research director of the think tank and also the director of the Berlin office. The summary of the report notes that the war in Ukraine has revealed Europeans' profound dependence on the U.S. for their security, despite claims that European leaders want to achieve strategic autonomy, especially French President Emmanuel Macron has talked a lot about that. Furthermore, over the last decade, the EU has grown relatively less powerful than the United States, economically, technologically, and militarily. Europeans are divided internally on strategic questions, and they look to Washington for leadership, as the policy briefing puts it. And in the first Cold War that the U.S. led against the Soviet Union and socialist countries, Europe was a central front of superpower competition. Now, however, the policy briefing notes that the U.S. expects the EU and also the United Kingdom to fall in line behind its China strategy, that is the new Cold War against China. And the U.S. uses its leadership position to force Europe to cut its ties with China. And the, the report says very clearly that Europe is becoming an American vassal. And it argues that this is bad for both sides and argues for Europe to become more independent and not simply subordinate itself completely to the United States. Now, I really want to stress this point. These are not the words of an anti-war activist. These are not the words of a critic of European or U.S. foreign policy. These are the words of one of the most influential political organizations in all of Europe that is funded by European Union member states. If you go to the European Council on Foreign Relations website, it lists its donors. These include the governments of France, Germany, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, the Netherlands, also the European Parliament, Belgium, Ireland, Denmark, Finland, Italy, Norway, Spain, Sweden, the Czech Republic, and also Japan, which is of course not part of Europe. Also on its website, the European Council on Foreign Relations, which is known by the acronym ECFR, boasts of how influential it is, noting that it's the only think tank that has a truly pan-European footprint with offices in Berlin, London, Madrid, Paris, Rome, Sofia, and Warsaw, as well as a presence in Brussels. The website has a chart boasting of the prominent members of its council, that is, over 330 elite members from all across Europe, and these include 19 former or current heads of state and government, 31 prominent European officials, business leaders, civil society leaders, 30 foreign ministers, 13 government ministers, 19 ambassadors. So this is the elite of the elites. This is the who's who of the political class and also the economic class, the ruling class in Europe. I should also point out that the European Council on Foreign Relations itself is based on a very similar U.S. organization called the Council on Foreign Relations. The CFR, as it's known, is based in New York, and it essentially represents Wall Street's links to the U.S. government. And it has a revolving door with the U.S. government and especially the State Department. Former U.S. government officials often go to work at the Council on Foreign Relations and vice versa. Members of the CFR are an elite 
who's who of U.S. officials in the government and in business. So the European Council on Foreign Relations is modeled off of the same think tank in the U.S. And it really ironically symbolically represents how Europe really has become a vassal of the United States. Now, the fact that an article like this was published at the European Council on Foreign Relations, I think, reflects that there are people in the European political class who are frustrated increasingly with the fact that they've become a vassal of the U.S. and they do truly want to maintain more strategic autonomy and independence. So by publishing this policy paper, it's one of their ways to, you know, meekly criticize the United States and call for a more independent foreign policy. I'm going to go through some of the main points of this and analyze what I think are the correct arguments and what I think are some misleading arguments. Because, of course, the authors of this report, Jeremy Shapiro, who's the research director of the European Council of Foreign Relations, he himself worked at the State Department. He was an advisor to top U.S. officials. And the other co-author, Jana Puglieren, is the head of the European Council of Foreign Relations Berlin office, who likewise has a history of being an advisor for members of the German parliament, the Bundestag, and is closely linked to elite politics in Germany. So, I mean, these people, again, are not critics of Western imperialism and foreign policy, but the fact that they're acknowledging this, I think, is very important. Now, they begin this article talking about the debate in Europe over whether or not to send tanks to Ukraine. And the policy brief points out that Germans, Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz was unwilling to send Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine unless the US also sent its own battle tank, the M1 Abrams. And essentially he was asking for permission from daddy. The article notes, quote, like a scared child in a room full of strangers, Germany felt alone if Uncle Sam was not holding its hand. I mean, this is a brutal in indictment of, the, of just how the U.S. has con completely ex exercised control and dominance over Europe. The article points out that this episode about tanks for Ukraine, of course, the U.S. and Britain and the EU ended up agreeing to send tanks to Ukraine to wage this proxy war against Russia. But the article points out that this episode raises more fundamental questions about the Atlantic Alliance other than just the issue of which weapon system to send to Ukraine. Why does the leader of the most powerful country in Europe, Germany, believe he is alone and defenseless unless he acts in lockstep with the U.S.? Because he's become a vassal, as the article points out. It describes this as a process of vassalization. And it argues that to survive and prosper in the long term, the Atlantic Alliance needs a European pillar that is both militarily capable and politically independent. And that is precisely why they published this policy brief. Now, the article, in addition to referring to the vassalization of Europe, also refers to the Americanization of Europe. And it points out that when Donald Trump was president coming in 2017, Policymakers across Europe began talking about sovereignty and autonomy as mechanisms to establish independence from an increasingly capricious American ally. However, they acknowledge that this didn't go anywhere. It didn't actually result in concrete changes. At the end of the day, the fact that Trump was president didn't really change the fact that there is a bipartisan foreign policy in the United States that is shifting toward Asia. And this began with Obama and the so-called pivot to Asia, which really means pivot to war in Asia and war on China. And this article points out that U.S. foreign policy has been strategically moving toward Asia and U.S. domestic policies were drifting toward self-absorption. In 2019, the new president of the European Commission, that is the highest official in the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, formed a new geopolitical commission and vowed to make the EU an independent actor in global affairs, and yet little happened to turn this idea into practical action. It didn't result in anything. 
And then when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, after the US and NATO and the EU refused to give Russia any security guarantees and insisted that Ukraine would join NATO, what that did is it did more than simply call into question the idea of independent European foreign policy. It exposed this idea of European strategic autonomy as almost entirely empty. That's the way they put it, almost entirely empty. It reset the alliance back into its traditional Cold War mode. The strategic decisions are all made in Washington. Now, this policy paper argues that there are two main reasons for this. One, the U.S. has simply become much more powerful compared to the European Union, and thus the EU has become more dominated by the United States. And this reflects the lack of agency in Europe. That, that's the term they use, lack of agency, and the growing power imbalance in the Western alliance. And the other significant factor they claim behind this is that Europe itself is divided. The EU internally has failed to reach a consensus on what greater strategic sovereignty would look like. And American leadership remains necessary because Europeans are incapable of leading themselves. I wouldn't put it that way. I think that in Europe, there are simply many different economic and geopolitical interests. And as a bloc, it's completely incoherent. There's no reason that Britain, well, of course, Britain left the EU, so that that's, it only further bolsters my point. There's no coherent reason that Spain has the same economic interests as Germany or Poland. These are countries that are completely different, geostrategically geo located. I mean, clearly, Germany, a country that relies very heavily on its manufacturing for its economy, is going to need a lot more energy than countries that don't have significant manufacturing sectors like Spain. And that means that Germany needs a lot of natural gas, which comes from Russia. So Germany naturally would have a much closer relationship with Russia than a country like Spain, which would probably have more close relations with North Africa and the African continent. But instead, this bloc of the European Union, which is completely contradictory, forces many of these countries to adopt completely different economic policies. Now, and of course, it subordinates weaker economies because they have a shared currency, like, for instance, Spain and Italy and Greece, which have been subordinated to the larger economies like Germany and France, which have imposed austerity measures and neoliberal economic policies on these countries that have re resulted in stagnation and high levels of unemployment and inequality and poverty and an inability to grow. And that's a point that I'm going to come to in a second here. But this article argues that the U.S. economy has grown significantly more than the European Union. On the crudest GDP measure, the EU, the U.S. has drastically outgrown the EU and the United Kingdom combined over the last 15 years. And it looks at the policy briefing, looks at GDP in nominal figures and points out that in 2008, the EU's economy was somewhat larger than the U.S. economy. The EU economy was $16 trillion versus the U.S. economy was $14.7 trillion. However, as of 2022, in nominal figures, the U.S. economy grew to 25 trillion, whereas the EU and the U.K. combined are less than 20 trillion. However, I actually think this is misleading, and I think they're actually overstating the economic power of the United States. It's misleading to use nominal figures because what that does is it simply converts the euro, because in Europe they don't use the dollar, they use the euro, it converts all the euro figures to dollars. That's not a good way to measure the size of an economy. The best way is through purchasing power parity, PPP. So if you go to IMF data, the International Monetary Fund, and the most recent data set is from April 2023, and you look at it simply in GDP in current prices, so this is not constant prices, that is to say, this is not adjusted for inflation, this is not real GDP. This is simply the, the nominal GDP figure in dollars. These are the figures that are constantly used by mainstream neoliberal economists and corporate media outlets, which again, are misleading. And yes, the graph shows that 
ever since around 2012, the US and the European Union, their economic paths have been separating. And it looks like the US has been growing much more than the European Union, which has been completely stagnant really since the 2008 financial crash. And I should point out that this IMF data includes the, Euro the United Kingdom as a member of the EU in its data. And of course, the United Kingdom left the EU through Brexit in 2016. So, I mean, this data actually for the EU is even higher than it should be. You should, that's why I included the UK in the data. So after 2016, you should subtract around two, nearly $3 trillion of GDP from the European Union GDP. So it's actually not really 14, it's really more around 11 trillion dollars of GDP. But again, this is only if you're looking at nominal measurements, which is not a good measurement. What we should actually look at instead is GDP, that is the gross domestic product, the size of the entire economy, all goods and services of an economy, and instead measure it at purchasing power parity, PPP, which as the name suggests, uses the purchasing power of the currency that is used in that economy. So the euro, if you use the euro, what is the basket of goods that you can buy? And the basket of goods is the same in every country. So that's a way of, of actually setting a, a set rate that is equivalent. So the US economy doesn't actually look bigger than it actually is. And if you look at PPP, you can see that in reality, US economic growth has basically been the exact same as the European Union. This is GDP PPP in current prices, not constant prices. So again, this is not real GDP. This is not adjusted for inflation. We can see that in reality, the stagnation that we saw in the European Union since 2008 has actually also happened in the United States. Because when you measure PPP, you see that the European Union and the US have basically grown at the exact same pace, which is to say stagnation. The reason, if you look at GDP in nominal terms, that the US economy looks like it's growing more than the European Union is simply a result of inflation, of asset price inflation, of the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, printing $8 trillion and buying up a bunch of assets through quantitative easing. Now, of course, the European Central Bank also did quantitative easing, but the US asset price inflation, the bubble of asset prices just growing is just completely off the charts. And that explains why it looks like the US economy was growing so much. But again, this is not real GDP. And when we measure nominal GDP, we're measuring it in US dollars. But if we use purchasing power parity instead, we can see that the EU economy and the US economy are basically equal. And again, this is including Britain, including the United Kingdom in the EU data, which can be a bit misleading. But we can also see this clearly if we look at real GDP growth. So that is adjusted for inflation. And we can see that basically the US and the EU and really the United Kingdom have had very similar levels of real GDP growth. They basically track with each other. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but really you can see that these are economies that are closely interlinked, closely overlapping, and they are also neoliberal economies. Yes, some of the European economies are slightly less neoliberal than the US. So for instance, Germany and France have slightly less neoliberal economies than the US, but this is the EU as an aggregate, taking all of the EU countries, and the UK has been very neoliberal, like the United States, and we can see that they have been in economic stagnation for really 20 years, but especially since the 2008 financial crash. What is really the most revealing graph here from the IMF data shows the GDP based on PPP, purchasing power parity, as a percentage share of the entire world economy. And here you can see the reality, which is that in general, there has been a stagnation in the West and the Western economies have been declining in their share of the overall global economy. In 1980, the US economy represented a bit over 20% in the 1980s of the global economy. And the European Union represented 
a little over 25%, about around one quarter of the global economy. And Britain itself, the United Kingdom was around four. But if you go down over time, you do see that the European Union's percentage of the global economy shrinks while the U.S. stays relatively st static around 20 percent. And then since the 2000s, both have been falling at basically a similar rate in their share of the global economy. And we see that today the U.S. and the European Union, and that's including the U.K. and the EU data, despite the fact that the U.K. left. Right. So. The U.S. represents around 15% of the global economy, measured PPP, and the EU represents really around 12.5%, and the U.K. represents around 2% of global GDP. Now, the reason I wanted to go through all of that data and explain that is because I do agree with the European Council on Foreign Relations policy paper that Politically and militarily, and even in some ways economically, the U.S. is more powerful than the EU and is exerting control over the EU, which has been subordinated to Washington. However, I don't want us to overstate U.S. economic power, which has been declining with the rise of China and also other economies. So I, I think it's important not to overstate that the fact that the U.S. supposedly has been growing more economically than Europe. In fact, if you look at the real data, the U.S. and Europe have been in the same ec economic stagnation that the neoliberal model has pushed them into and they're not going to get out of. And I think it's very easy to explain why, by the way. And that's because the so-called economic growth that the U.S. has seen since the 2008 financial crash has been low quality economic growth based on a big bubble of asset price inflation. The central bank, the Federal Reserve, using quantitative easing and buying up all these assets, including mortgage-backed securities, toxic assets that no one really wanted to buy, and furthermore, buying treasury bonds, buying U.S. government debt to artificially you know, create this big bubble. And all this money went into pumping up the price of the S&P 500 of stocks of big U.S. corporations, which exploded in their nominal value. Although, again, it's not actually corresponding with real economic growth, high quality economic growth of creating tangible goods and services that people can use for their lives. And at the same time, we've also seen a massive increase in living costs through the form of real estate prices skyrocketing significantly more than wages have. And what this means is that the U.S. economy looks bigger than it actually is. And this isn't to mention the fact that as workers have become more and more precarious in their work and more and more people, they claim to be employed and unemployment figures look low. But how many people are working for Uber or for some sharing app and they're not actually really steadily employed. They don't have benefits. They don't have a steady wage. It's increasingly precarious work. And keep in mind also that GDP only measures all of the goods and services in an economy. It doesn't measure what those goods and services are, if they're productive, if they contribute to the real economy. And you can look at things like healthcare, for instance, where the U.S. spends nearly 20 percent of its entire GDP on healthcare and has the worst results in this privatized for-profit corporate system, the U.S. spends three to four times more on its healthcare than South Korea, New Zealand, and Japan, and has the worst results. So a lot of so-called U.S. GDP growth includes all of this overhead, this bureaucracy of these insurance corporations and these big corporations that refuse to pay for people to actually get health care treatment. And it pushes up the cost of health care. And that contributes to GDP growth or bank fees or overdraft fees and all of these things contribute to GDP growth on paper, but that's not the actual real economy. So it looks like the U.S. economy has been growing, but it's not real. So I know that was a long aside, but the reason I wanted to go through it is because it's very important to point out that U.S. economic growth has not really been higher than Europe. In this article at the European Council on Foreign Relations, I do agree with the thesis that Europe has become a vassal of the U.S. and that the U.S. has militarily 
and politically and even economically subordinated Europe. That's true, but we shouldn't overstate U.S. economic power, which has been declining with the rise of China and other countries. And the fact that the U.S. economy looks like it's been growing is not actually accurate. And the U.S. has been in the same problem of structural economic stagnation due to its oligarchic neoliberal capitalist economic model that the EU has been stuck in. So anyway, let's go back to look at the other elements of this policy paper at the European Council on Foreign Relations. In addition to Europe's economic decline, the article points out that the US dollar plays an important role in maintaining US economic hegemony. And I strongly do agree with this point. It says that the US dollar, according to data from the Bank for International Settlements, the US dollar was bought or sold in around 88% of global foreign exchange transactions in 2022. And this share has remained stable over the past 20 years, whereas the euro was bought or sold in only 31% of transactions, a decline from its peak at 39% in 2010. However, this is also another misleading figure that overstates the economic power of the US and EU because 88% sounds like a lot, right? Wow, 88%, that's very close to 100. However, this data is looking at the use of the dollar being bought or sold. That is to say, when you have exchanges, when you have transactions in the foreign exchange market, there are two sides of those transactions and there are two different currencies, right? So they're saying that the dollar is on one, at least one side, well, obviously it's on not both sides. So the dollar is on one side of those transactions 88% of the time. However, that means 88% out of 200%, not out of 100%. So in reality, the actual figure of the US dollar being involved in foreign exchange transactions is only 44% total if you don't double count the two sides, right? And it actually means that in terms of the euro, it's only involved in 15.5% of the transactions if you, again, don't double count. So that, that figure alone shows that US and EU economic hegemony have been in significant decline, which explains the new Cold War, of course, and why the US has been so desperate and why the US is trying to prevent de-dollarization. Now, the article also points out, using the commonly used figure, that the US dollar represents around 60% of the official foreign exchange reserves of central banks around the world compared to the euro accounting for 21%. However, that is also a very generous reading. This is based on data that was published by the International Monetary Fund in a study in 2022. And the IMF reported that as of 2021, the dollar represented slightly under 60%, 59% of the foreign exchange reserves in central banks around the world. And that had fallen from a little over 70%, 71% in 2000. However, this figure is overstated as well. The Financial Times published a very strangely titled article this April, which is dollar frowny face, but with very important data. And it quotes the well-known economist Stephen Jen, who was a currency analyst at the U.S. investment bank Morgan Stanley. He's very well respected. And he did his own number crunching. And he found that in reality, when you adjust for price changes, the dollar share of official global reserve currencies has gone down from around 73% in 2001 to 55% in 2021. So that's lower than the IMF data. And as of 2022, it fell to 47% of total global reserves. That is that the US dollar is under half of the global reserves held by central banks. And in the report notes that the US dollar is losing its market share as a reserve currency at a much faster rate than is commonly believed. The dollar they calculate, these economists calculated, has lost some 11% of its market share since 2016 and double that amount since 2008. That erosion accelerated precipitously with the new phase of the war in Ukraine and Russia and China 
moving to de-dollarize and de-dollarizing their trade with other countries and holding more and more gold and other currencies and other assets in their foreign exchange reserves and fewer and fewer dollar and even euro denominated assets. So once again, the reason I went on a long aside there is because I wanna point out while we're analyzing this report at the European Council of Foreign Relations, that it is actually overstating the economic power of the US and the EU. Their economic hegemony has been in serious decline, which again explains the new Cold War on China, why politicians from both sides of the aisle in Washington and also in many parts of Europe are increasingly desperate about trying to destabilize and weaken China. Anyway, getting back to this report, just keep in mind that it is overstating the influence of the US and EU at the same time, while correctly analyzing the, the US power in that unbalanced relationship. It is certainly true that Washington has become much more pow powerful in the transatlantic alliance. What the article is right about is that the US has profited from the continuing dominance of its currency to gain an ever expanding capacity to impose financial sanctions on its enemies and allies alike without really needing anyone's cooperation. That is true. However, it points out that Russia and China are fighting back with some success. That is to say, de-dollarization is picking up steam. They acknowledge that. So this is only short term. In the long term, the US will no longer be able to simply sanction anyone it wants around the world without any consequences because there will be other alternatives to the US dominated financial system and the interbank messaging system, the SWIFT system, which ironically is based in Belgium, by the way, but is actually really controlled by Washington. Now, one area where this policy paper is absolutely correct is talking about US technological dominance over Europe. This is indisputably true. Large US tech companies, the big five big tech corporations of Alphabet, that is Google, Amazon, Apple, Meta, that is Facebook, and Microsoft are now close to dominating the tech landscape in Europe. And they point out, this is kind of a backhanded compliment to China, that unlike China, Europe has been unable to develop local tech alternatives. So any, even though you know, we see some fining of US big tech corporations like Google, it's not actually going to lead to any significant change because there are no alternatives. And China, on the other hand, has developed its own tech companies. And this has often led the, the West and the US in particular to criticize China and say, well, why does China ban Western tech companies? Well, it's not because China is this big, evil, authoritarian boogeyman that wants to control everything that its people do. No, it's because China believes in this concept which is never talked about, of technological sovereignty. That's a term I've never heard discussed in the West. Technological sovereignty or digital sovereignty. China has its own tech corporations, its own tech companies that are not beholden to the United States, whereas all of the big tech corporations in Silicon Valley are US government contracts. Google is a CIA contractor. Amazon is a CIA contractor. Google had contracts with the US military doing mapping during the war in Iraq. Google has contracts with many different police departments in the United States and the FBI and is involved in surveillance technology. So this article points out that Europe doesn't have technological sovereignty, which means that these US big tech corporations can spy on Europe, which is exactly what the, the NSA, the National Security Agency did, spying on German Chancellor Angela Merkel and other top officials in Europe. So a very interesting backhanded compliment there to China. And the article points out that new developments like artificial intelligence seem set to reinforce US technological dominance over Europe. Since 2008, Europeans have also suffered a dramatic loss of military power compared to the US. And here, this is absolutely true once again, although it's not measured for inflation and purchasing power parity. So these figures can be a little misleading, but they're still largely true. Between 2008 and 2021, US military spending increased from 656 billion to 800 billion, although that is an understatement. In reality, that's according to the official discretionary budget from the federal government, but in reality, 
The discretionary spending, the so-called non-dispense spending, as they report it, includes things like veterans benefits, which is obviously part of military spending. So in reality, U.S. military spending is significantly higher. It's, it's really over a trillion dollars. And that's not to mention the fact that the Pentagon has failed every audit it's ever tried. And there's tens of trillions of dollars of unaccounted spending by the D Department of Defense. But regardless, in the same period, well, U.S. spending grew by 140 billion in the European Union and the UK, military spending only grew from 303 to 325 billion. Now, again, this is not real terms. It's not measured. It's not adjusted for inflation and it's not measured with purchasing power parity. So in reality, when you look at the size of the European economies and their spent military spending as a percentage of GDP, that increase is a little more significant, but it's not as significant. And it does, it is true that the US military definitely overpowers Europe. Now, continuing in this report, it points out that furthermore, there have been a lot of internal divisions in Europe. The 2008 financial crisis divided the North and the South. This is obliquely acknowledging that Germany, which basically controlled the European Central Bank, imposed brutal neoliberal austerity measures on countries like Spain and Portugal and Italy and Greece. And we all remember the Greece crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, where the Greek working class was just sacrificed at the altar of neoliberalism of the European Central Bank. And the Greek working class, I mean, their living standards were destroyed. Their wages went down, unemployment skyrocketed, poverty skyrocketed. And the same thing in Italy and Spain, and the European Central Bank and European Commission and also the IMF forced these countries to implement austerity policies, claiming that they had too much debt. But what actually happened is their GDP shrank and in reality, their debt to GDP increased. So even though their, their nominal debt decreased, their, their debt as a percentage of the size of their economy increased. So anyway, the point is that this is acknowledging that, again, as I said earlier, the European Union is completely divided internally. It's completely incoherent. And I don't think it's going to survive a few more decades, but that's a whole other point for discussion. The article points out that the migration crisis has divided the EU. The war in Ukraine has divided East and West. Brexit divided the UK from the rest of the EU. And e US dominance in the alliance has grown. The growing weight of the U.S. and the relationship means that Europeans feel in increasingly incapable of acting and Americans feel increasingly less interested in what Europeans think about security issues. And they're absolutely right about that. The policy briefing points out that we can see this in actions like, for instance, the U.S. has been moving away from Europe and focusing on militarizing Asia to prepare for war on China, really, the new Cold War. It points out, for instance, the U.S. created this military alliance AUKUS of Australia, the U.K. and the U.S., and that angered France because Australia canceled submarine agreements it had with France in order to get nuclear-powered submarines from the U.S. and the U.K., and that, of course, angered the second most powerful country in the, U in the EU, France. And the article points out that it is the U.S. that has been shaping most Western sanctions on Russia, especially the sanctions on Russia's central bank. And the seizing, the theft of half of the Russian central bank's foreign exchange reserves, which is more than $300 billion worth of dollar and euro denominated assets, which is just piracy on the international stage. And it points out that the U.S. dollar and American control of the international financial system have given sanctions their bite. So that part is true, although, again, we shouldn't overstate U.S. economic power or European economic power. Now, the article also points out that the U.S. has been more uh, has been increasingly milita militarizing Europe. And this is true. This is an important point we should keep in mind. The U.S. troop deployments in Europe increased from around 65,000 to now 100,000 and growing. At the NATO summit in June 2022, Biden announced the U.S. is going to further expand its military presence in Europe, including new forces and headquarters in Poland, Romania, and the Baltic states. And 
The article points out, by the way, that in terms of the internal divisions, even on Russia, there are divisions. So, for instance, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and French President Emmanuel Macron, they were, were actually trying to have some kind of political rapprochement with Russia. They didn't want this new phase of the proxy war with Russia. It was largely the U.S. and the U.K. and some of the Eastern European countries like Poland. And the article points out Schultz and Macron believed until the very eve of the Russian invasion that a compromise with M Russia was possible. And it was possible. Russia in 2021 sent the U.S., NATO and the EU a series of demands for security guarantees, and it was completely ignored. And of course, this isn't to mention NATO constantly expanding up onto Russia's borders, despite the fact that repeatedly Western officials in NATO told the former Soviet Union that after the reunification of Germany, they would not expand one inch east. And they lied. Your, NATO has added more than a dozen new members all east of Germany. So there, so France and Germany were right to think that they could have negotiated with Russia. But now we see that the U.S. has helped to destroy that with the proxy war in Ukraine, which has only further subordinated Europe to the U.S. and turned it into a vassal, which is exactly the point of analysis to today. Now, the article points out that no autonomous European policy was possible in terms of Russia, because without the U.S., Europeans probably would not have agreed on anything at all. That means that Washington was the only real choice. Although, not really, rapprochement with Russia was a choice. But anyway, we see now that Europe is fighting Washington's war on its behalf. And Ukrainians, unfortunately, are the ones dying. So the article points out that the war in Ukraine will end someday. And when it does, or even before it does, American policymakers will likely return to their previous shift toward Asia. They're going to move their resources toward war on China. And the U.S. National Security Strategy, published in October 2022, says this very clearly. It says that the U.S. will, quote, prioritize maintaining an enduring competitive edge over China, which is the new Cold War. It's their polite way of saying that. And the U.S. national security strategy also says, quote, China is the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to do so. And the article points out that a future Republican administration in Washington would likely double down on the new Cold War on Russia, as most Republican leaders have an even more dire view of China and a more jaundiced view of European allies than their Democratic counterparts. So the new Cold War on China is bipartisan. Washington is going to try to destabilize Beijing no matter the cost. Now, this article points out that there is, you know, potentially a grain of hope in France. Paris seems to be the last of the countries that's really willing to try to have some kind of independent foreign policy, while the rest of Europe has almost completely renounced the idea of greater strategic autonomy. So they've become all vassals. They're basically acknowledging that they've all given up hope except France. And, you know, Emmanuel Macron in France claims to try to be more independent, although I'm very skeptical of him as well. And th what's incredible is how rapid this transformation was. The article points out that... Long are the days when Martin Schultz, the Social Democratic candidate for chancellor in 2017, not Olaf Schultz, he criticized Germany's NATO commitment to spend 2% of GDP on the military, saying, quote, he would not submit to a U.S. logic of rearmament. And now the, so the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, is doing exactly that. The policy briefing points out that the SPD used to be critical of the U.S., and now they're, fearly, they're clearly feeling comfortable under Washington's wing as vassals. Now, not too much more here. Going further in the report, the European Council on Foreign Relations points out that by not developing its own military technology, this means that Europe has created dependencies that will last for decades.
The result is that the Europeans risk abandoning the development of a strong competitive European defense industry. Furthermore, they talk about the Cold War Alliance. And this is a very interesting analysis. I'm just going to read this here. The U.S. and its European partners may have returned to its Cold War Alliance habits, but of course the current geopolitical situation is vastly different than during the first Cold War. Europe then was at the central front in a struggle with the Soviet Union, and U.S. strategy, especially in the early days, hinged on rebuilding Western Europe both economically and militarily so that it could stand up to the socialist bloc in the East. And they point out, at the beginning of the first Cold War, after the end of World War II in 1945, the U.S. had a massive surplus, a massive trade surplus, and a current account surplus with the rest of the world. And they claim, this is something I disagree with in this article, they claim that the U.S. didn't use its dominant security role for economic advantage domestically. Because instead, what happened is that the U.S. became it had a massive current account deficit and a trade deficit with Europe, and it became the main market of choice for European goods. However, they're actually misunderstanding. This is exactly what was explained by the economist Michael Hudson in his book, Super Imperialism. After the US dollar was taken off of gold in 1971 with the Nixon shock, and it became a freely floating fiat currency, it, it's not pegged to anything of, of serious value. So the reason that it continues to be the global reserve currency is because of the petrodollar and trade by Saudi Arabia of oil in dollars, but also because Europe and Japan and other US allies were investing their excess dollars in U.S. treasuries and U.S. debt. So they're the ones that allowed the U.S. to maintain this massive deficit. And what that actually means is that Europe has been on the losing side. Europe has been exporting all of these products, especially Germany with its massive current account surplus, to the U.S., and the Europe and the U.S. has basically been getting all of these European goods basically for free because the U.S. doesn't need to produce $100 of value in order to import $100 of goods because it's buying those goods usually in dollars. All it needs to do is print those dollars. So this, this article actually misunderstands how the U.S. has had a free lunch thanks to dollar hegemony. This is precisely the point they don't understand. So actually, the U.S. has benefited from this relationship for decades. This is not something new with the European Union. But anyway, continuing. What I do agree with with this analysis is they are correct. Now, the U.S. new Cold War against China is quite different. Europe is not the central front in this new Cold War, and its prosperity and military strength are not central to U.S. strategy. The U.S. under Biden has consciously adopted a strategic industrial policy aimed at American reindustrialization and technological dominance over China. And here they, are, they talk about the legislation of the Biden administration, especially the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA. I always laugh at the name of that, um, especially talking about, you know, the U.S.-British uh, alliance. But anyway, with an Irish Catholic president passing the IRA. Anyway, that's another aside. But the point is that that also the CHIPS Act, they point out in this article correctly that this is one about trying to weaken Chinese industry and it's a new form of industrial planning. That is industrial policy. There's a Freudian slip there. It's a new form of industrial policy, which is essentially US and a step toward government planning, although it's not real planning because it's just subsidies for these companies, but it's government shaping of strategic industries to advance US foreign policy interests through the use of subsidies and tax breaks. And this article points out that Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, and his senior director for international economics, Jennifer Harris, published an article advocating industrial policy, which neoliberals for decades said was completely anathema. It was once considered embarrassing and it, it reeked of elements of socialism, but now it should be considered something close to obvious. U.S. firms will continue to lose ground in the competition with Chinese companies if Washington continues to rely so heavily on private sector research and development. This is the U.S. government admitting that neoliberalism failed, that freeing the market and allowing capitalism to just do whatever it wants 
and big billionaire oligarch capitalists to do whatever they want is going to provide the most efficient allocation of resources and it's going to provide the most prosperity. No, 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 no. That was all a lie. And it was a lie that benefited the interest of the capitalists. That's why they spent so much money spreading that propaganda, funding economists, funding economics departments around the world, funding the media, right, to spread that lie. But the reality is that the U.S. government has now reluctantly come to the admission that they need to have some element of state planning or at least some involvement, state involvement in guiding strategic industries, or China is going to completely decimate all of their industries, which are just completely bloated through stock buybacks and financialization and just a completely unproductive financial speculation that has nothing to do with real economic growth. And by, by spending hundreds of billions of dollars, and that's an underestimate probably, through the Inflation Reduction Act, through subsidies to these companies, this is the U.S. government acknowledging that neoliberalism failed, and you have to have state guidance of the economy. You have to have state guidance. But instead of having socialism in China, like in China, or Vietnam, or Cuba, instead, the U.S. is having basically socialism for the rich, right? It's allowing the capitalist class to get these big, massive subsidies and fat government contracts, subsidizing them while poverty gets worse. Unemployment gets worse. Inequality, well, I said on paper, unemployment looks like it's getting better, but again, it's with this precari precariat, right? With the increasingly precarious work and the gigification of jobs in the US and also increasing inequality. So this is the US response to neoliberalism failing is returning to industrial policy and corporate welfare while abandoning its people and not increasing the social safety net. So. Unlike the golden era of Keynesianism in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, where there was a massive increase in social spending and the safety net, we, we do see an increase in industrial planning and subsidies for the corporate sector, but we don't see the correspondent increase in the social safety net and social spending. But anyway, again, I know this is very long and I go in so many asides, but I mean, we're talking about topics that literally could not be more important. These are the most important geopolitical and economic issues in the world today. And that's why I'm spending so much time analyzing this and going on asides, because I think they're actually important to understand the reality of what's happening and to look through some of the propaganda that is still embedded in this article, because it, once again, I'm reading from the European Council on Foreign Relations, which is the elite of the elite in Europe. So they still have their own biases and, and prejudices and and misleading talking points that I want to pick apart. So this article points out that U.S. policies like the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act, their key role from a U.S. perspective is to support U.S. strategic industrial policy and to help ensure American technological dominance vis-a-vis -vis China. China <laughs> vis -a -vis China. Sorry, I went into Spanish mode for a second there. Um, importantly, in this new geoeconomic struggle with China, there will be no purely economic issues. The technological and economic nature of the conflict with China means that the U.S. can and will securitize nearly every international dispute. And of course, that benefits the U.S. So they point out that the U.S. can't benefit with Chinese companies. So they can't com compete with Chinese companies. So instead, what the U.S. does is it uses these incentives like the IRA and also it uses sanctions to try to cripple Chinese companies and benefit US companies. And as an example, they point out Huawei, the Chinese tech giant. The US pressured Europe to cut all of its contracts with Huawei, which also, by the way, meant that Europe is gonna be several years behind 5G technology compared to other potential, uh, you know, companies because Huawei is the world's leading company in 5G technology. And, and also a lot of Huawei technology is much cheaper, which is why European countries are going along with it. So now they have to pay more for more expensive Western technology, which also hurts their economic growth. But anyway, the point is that this article acknowledges that banning Huawei sales in Europe also creates an opportunity for U.S. companies to establish greater technological dominance, which is, of course, a feature, not a bug. That's the intended U.S. goal. 
And finally, these policies are going to deindustrialize Europe and the US is going to benefit from deindustrializing Europe. This point is absolutely spot on. It is correct. These policies have the potential to reduce economic growth in Europe, cause further deindustrialization, or even deny Europeans dominant positions in key industries of the future. This is absolutely true. Michael Hudson has talked about this a lot. The US can't compete with these Chinese companies, so it's using state industrial policy. Well, that is the US free market, right? the capitalist class without state support can't compete with China. So instead what they're doing is they're getting massive state corporate welfare and they're deindustrializing Europe. And through the subsidies and tax breaks, the US is incentivizing European companies to leave Europe to go overseas to the United States to open up shop. And by the way, of course, through the energy policy, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines and the cutting off of cheap Russian oil and gas to, to Europe, especially industrial powerhouses like Germany, is going to bankrupt European industry, which just can't be competitive with energy costs so high, which is why the German government is now talking about subsidizing the costs of 80% of energy consumption by big companies in Germany, which is going to be a massive drain, billions of euros spending to subsidize these companies. So. This is going to just it's leading to more and more economic suicide. And they're right that the US is benefiting from this. Now, finally, this is this is the main point. Europeans may whine and complain about all of these policies, but their increasing security dependence on the US means they will mostly accept economic policies framed as part of America's global security role. This is the essence of vassalization. This is the process of auto subservience in action. Europe is subordinating itself to the US. It is making itself subservient to the US. It is becoming a vassal. And this is the end. They talk about the process of vassalization and they say that in this process, quote, the US has in the process succeeded in getting almost everything it wants. Washington has won. Brussels has lost. And they're right about that. And they argue vassalization is not a smart policy for the coming era of intense geopolitical competition. This is their, and then they, they spend their time arguing about ways that Europe can get out of vassaliz vassalization. And they spend the rest of the time talking about their policies, their policy proposals for what Europe could do to try to be less of a vassal. But I mean, this is a very long policy paper. I went through the main points, but they mention some variation on the word vassal 12 times in that policy paper from the European Council on Foreign Relations, funded by all of the major EU member states, Germany, France, Belgium, Italy. They're all there. I mean, this is a very significant acknowledgement by probably the most powerful think tank in all of Europe that Europe has become a vassal of the United States. And while I had some criticisms of the article, some of their points overstating U.S. and also European economic power and overstating the hegemony of the U.S. dollar and all of that, I talk about all of those things, de-dollarization, in my regular analyses here. But the, the main point they're absolutely correct about, Europe has become a vassal of the United States. And I agree with them, Europe should be more independent. But their argument is that Europe should be more independent in order to save the transatlantic imperialist alliance that has subordinated the world, which is basically a neo-colonial system. I would argue completely differently. No, Europe needs to break with the United States. Yes, it needs to grow a spine and not be a vassal and maintain an independent foreign policy and stop helping the US try to pillage the world through imperialism. That's the goal we should really take away here. And that's the goal. That's the note that I'm going to end with. I'm Ben Norton, the editor of Geopolitical Economy Report. If you'd like the work that we do here, please consider supporting us. You can go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, and you can donate in several different ways. The best way is becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash geopolitical economy. We have no big institutional support, no big donors. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners, from the people who support us.
And by the way, speaking of viewers and listeners, on whatever platform you're on, please subscribe. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe. It helps with the algorithm. If you're on the on a podcast app, please subscribe and make sure you get notifications for more episodes. We are going to come back very soon with lots of geopolitical and economic analysis to understand the historic moment we're in in the world today. I'm Ben Norton. I want to thank everyone. I'll see you next time.